Those who live today will die tomorrow. Those who die tomorrow will be born again. Those who live met, true or righteous, will not die. The land of Egypt has long been a land of change, but consistent in its ancient antiquities. Whether it's the pyramids of Giza, the ruins eking out of the desert sands, or the mummies and relics being found in the new redevelopment of Egypt. Egypt of today would be nothing without the Egypt of the past. But why is it that the monuments and culture of ancient Egypt are icons of today, but nobody worships their gods, speaks their tongue, or writes in hieroglyphs anymore? Today we will explore this mystery of the past and investigate the rise and the fall of the ancient Egyptian religion. Ancient Egypt, or Kemet in the Egyptian language, is a land created by the flow of the Nile. Without the Nile, the lands between Sudan and Egypt would be nothing but desert, a pile of sand. The Nile is credited for the founding of the Egyptian civilization and allowing for the production of agriculture along its banks. With the Nile's annual flooding rejuvenating the surrounding farmland and bringing nutrients to the soil. Though the annual flooding was fickle, some years it would rise above the banks and devastate the land. Other years it would dry up, leaving the soil unirrigated and causing a shortage in grain. However, to counter this fluctuation, the goddess of the Nile would be routinely presented with worship and offerings to bless the lands of Egypt. The Nile is best described as this. The Nile is Egypt, and Egypt is the Nile. The religion of ancient Egypt grew up along the Nile, with the Nile taking place for many of the famous stories and traditions of the gods, such as the myth of Osiris, where his body was thrown into the Nile after being cut apart. In the Egyptian language, there is no name for the Nile, it is simply called the river. The beginnings of ancient Egyptian religion are surrounded in mystery. However, pre-dynastic Egypt was believed to be a land of multiple gods and goddesses, with a form of animism taking place, with many towns and independent kingdoms having their own deities. With the unification of Egypt under the first pharaoh, Narmer, the religion and its organization began to take root and these gods and goddesses began to coalesce together into one pantheon. As pharaohs of the early dynastic era began to consolidate power, their ascendancy to the divine began. In later dynasties and kingdoms, the title of pharaoh began to have a spiritual responsibility and position associated with it. Kings of ancient Egypt were no longer seen as men, but rather as mediators of Ra, Amun, and the gods and goddesses between his subjects. And the pharaoh himself often was portrayed as a god. The pharaoh was the divine son of Horus. Over time, the pharaoh began to be responsible for keeping the cosmic order of ancient Egypt known as Mat, and to keep his people and their gods happy. To keep the state running and to function as administrators and religious leaders, a priestly class began to develop based out of Egypt's numerous temples, especially those of Thebes. For now, these priests keep records, maintain the temples, and act as advisors to the pharaoh, recommending the pharaoh as to the actions to appease the gods and goddesses. Though in time, these priests will become just as powerful as the pharaoh. For the audience, we are still far from the construction of the pyramids. We are currently in the era of 3100 BC to 2600 BC, otherwise known as early dynastic Egypt. As Egypt began to develop, so did its gods. While the pantheon of Egypt held over 2000 deities, many of these were minor gods who were often the gods of certain towns, animals, or professions, such as Apish, the god of turtles. However, there were only 12 truly important deities, Osiris, the god of the underworld and resurrection, 
Isis, the wife of Osiris and the goddess of the moon and motherhood. Horus, son of Isis and Osiris, often featured with the falcon head and was the protectors of the pharaohs in addition to being the god of wind and war. Set, the god of chaos. Sobek, the god featured with the crocodile head who created the Nile from his sweat. Ra, the creator god and god of the sun. Ptah, god of the craftsmen. Hathor, goddess of motherhood and is featured with the head of a cow. Anubis, the god of mummification and the dead and is featured with the head of a jackal. Amon, a later god of the new kingdom but associated with air. Geb, god of the earth and father of snakes. Nut, goddess of the sky. Though it must be said that as Egypt transformed over time, so did their gods, with some taking on extra roles or becoming less important over time. Monuments began to be decorated with images of the gods and goddesses in this world and the afterlife. Images of gods from Osiris to Hapi being featured in frescoes on temples and pyramids across Egypt sprang up. Much like the Abrahamic faiths, the Egyptians believed in the afterlife. However, their journey to the afterlife was quite different. After death, the Egyptian would be taken to the Duat, a dark and dangerous land filled with gods, spirits, and demons. The dead would be met with varying challenges and demons and would have to pass each test or be eaten and their soul sent into an eternal oblivion. If they passed, they would go before the gods Anubis and Toth and recite each sin they did not commit. Their heart would then be weighed against a feather. If their sins in life were lighter than the feather, they would be sent to the field of reeds or Aru, where food was plentiful and they could spend an eternity farming and hunting in bliss. If their heart weighed down the feather and their sins were too great, the god Amet would devour their heart and the damned would spend eternity in the Duat, hunted by the demons, spirits, and monsters that resided there. To help those in the afterlife, the priests and family of the deceased would give offerings, spells, tokens, and the Book of the Dead to help them pass each test in the afterlife and reach the Field of Reeds. One particular aspect of Egyptian religion is the role of cats. As cats ate the mice that ate the grain, cats were necessary to store grain for hard times. They were also viewed as magical creatures for their nimbleness and were held with great reverence. Mummified cats often show up in the tombs of kings, queens, and many others as magical companions for the afterlife. There were even harsh penalties for killing a cat, whether accidental or intentional, where mobs would crowd around the accused and often without trial murder them. This great devotion is something humans may have forgotten over time, but not cats. To the Egyptians, mummification was a way of cleansing impurities of the body and the soul for the afterlife. To mummify an individual, their chest would be cut open, their organs would be removed and placed in jars for the afterlife. A hook-shaped needle would be inserted through the nose and used to pull out the brain. To fill their head, resin, incense, and other preservatives would be then poured into the skull. The body would be washed and their insides rubbed with salt, perfume, and resin. Their body would then lie in natron, a type of salt, for over 80 days, which would further dehydrate the body and preserve it. The body would then be wrapped in perfume-soaked linen, embalming it. The dead would be given offerings, prayers, and wisdom for their journey to the afterlife and be placed in a sarcophagus. And if they could afford it, they might be placed in a separate sarcophagus within the first. For those that could not afford it, the dead may be simply buried or very poorly mummified. As the Egyptian state became more organized, 
so did the priesthood and temples of the gods. Temples were seen as the literal home of the gods they held and required constant devotion and offerings to bless the land of Egypt and keep evil at bay. These temples became dependent on the offerings and support of the locals and the pharaoh, and in turn they kept the gods happy, supported local communities, and gave legitimacy to the pharaoh. The roles and power of the temples began to grow, with the temples eventually owning 30% of the fertile land in Egypt. And with each increase in land, their need of the pharaoh began to diminish, a problem that will come up later. Since religion in the Bronze Age was often seen as the success of the state itself, the religion of the pharaohs began to spread south as Egypt prospered. The lands of Nubia or Sudan would adopt the Egyptian pantheon and include their own gods, which for most of their history were subservient to Egypt. And the kingdom of Nubia even built more pyramids in Sudan than has ever existed in Egypt. Prayers and hymns would praise the gods and tell of their glory, such as this inscription from the temple of Karnak. A hymn of praise to Ra when he riseth in the eastern part of heaven. Those who are in his train rejoice, and lo, Osiris Ani, victorious, saith, Hail thou disc, thou lord of rays, who risest on the horizon day by day. Shine thou with thy beams of light upon the face of Osiris Ani, who is victorious. For he singeth hymns of praise unto thee at dawn, and he maketh thee to set at eventide with words of adoration. May the soul of Osiris Ani, the triumphant one, come forth with thee into heaven. May he go forth in the matet boat. May he come into port in the sectet boat. And may he cleave his path among the never-resting stars in the heavens. Under the reign of one pharaoh, the history and diversity of Egyptian religion would be swept under the rug. Pharaoh Amenhotep IV reigned from 1353 BC to 1334 BC, and for some unknown reason preferred the sun, or the Aten as it was called, over other Egyptian deities. Beginning his reign with symbols of the sun and its rays carved into varying temples and monuments across Egypt. He even changed his name as well, his reign beginning with the name Amenhotep, or Amun is satisfied, to Akhenaten, meaning effective for the Aten. Over time, this devotion to the sun became more fanatical and totalitarian, with the capital being moved to Armana, run by devoted worshippers of Aten alone, and the worship of other gods and goddesses being sidelined and eventually banned. Though this would be reversed by his son, Tutankhamun, the famous King Tut, Akhenaten's name and his depictions would be chiseled out of temples, public monuments, and his capital would be abandoned and left to ruin, and the priesthood and bureaucracy would do their best to wipe his name from history. Though his name would live on through scattered monuments lying in the dunes and his abandoned capital Amarna, his reign would diminish the authority of the pharaoh and lead to the rise of the temple priests who would one day rule Egypt. Though great kings would soon take over the land, such as Ramses II, under which Egypt would reach its power and wealth, territory, and strength, creating an empire from modern-day Lebanon to the coast of Libya and further south, expanding into the lands of Nubia, conquering these lands and going as far south as Eritrea. This power was only matched by one empire of the time, the Hittites of Anatolia. Their battles and conflict over the Levant region would famously lead to the Battle of Kadesh, the battle of the first recorded tactics and strategies, which ended in the first recorded peace treaty. Though bronze often looks gold when it's cleaned, over time it rusts and becomes brittle, just how the empire began to fall. Around this time of 1300 BC, changing climates, roaming bands of sea peoples, attacks by the Libyans, and most dangerously the collapse of the tin trade across the world, 
would lead the land of Egypt without the ability to make bronze, leaving them unable to make new tools, whether it's the sword, spear, or a farmer's sickle. Though Egypt would be the only state to survive the Bronze Age collapse, it would do so in a highly diminished state. Never again could Egypt become a great power. Following the Bronze Age collapse, neighboring kingdoms that had grown in tandem with Egypt fell apart. The Hittites, the Canaanites, the Mycenaeans, and more fell to famine, war, and possibly disease. As priests took more control of Egypt, they soon became the de facto leaders of the land, and the lack of central control invited previously subjugated people to attack. The slow trickle of wealth and land donations to the temple must have seemed minimal at first, but over time, as the wealth grew and compounded, the priests transformed from purely religious and bureaucratic figures to almost pharaoh-like in their wealth and their strength. Soon, the land of Egypt would be conquered by the Libyans, the Nubians, the Persians, the Assyrians, and more. Egypt would fall to the Macedonians soon, with Alexander the Great proclaiming to be Pharaoh. However, his death and the subsequent civil wars led to his general Ptolemy taking control of Egypt and establishing the final dynasty of Egypt. For 300 years, the Ptolemies reigned and incorporated Greek gods into their Egyptian pantheon, such as Serpius. And later in 30 BC, Egypt would be finally conquered by Rome, with the defeat of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium. With the introduction of Christianity to Egypt in 42 AD, long worshippers of Osiris, Isis, Amun, and Ra turned to worshipping Jesus Christ. There were many reasons for why people turned to Christianity instead of continuing their Egyptian religion. Over time, the role of the pharaoh as an intermediary of the gods diminished over time, which slowly chipped away at the spiritual leader of their religion, eventually becoming non-existent when the Romans turned Egypt into a province. Additionally, with the fall of the pharaoh and heavy taxation on Egypt by Rome, the ability to upkeep and maintain many of the temples began to diminish, and the Roman governors rarely paid to repair any temples or monuments. This cascaded with the loss of funding to the priestly class, which before had heavily relied on pharaoh donations and funding to maintain their status and position in the temples and local area, leading to their slow decline as Christianity spread. As the temples began to collapse, be buried in desert sand, or succumb to the Nile itself, it hurt the image of the god that was in that temple. As a temple was believed to be the literal house of a certain god, the collapse and failure to maintain that temple and perform rituals made that god appear dead or weak and unable to take care of itself and its worshippers, only further discrediting the religion as a whole. The church and missionaries in Alexandria were also incredibly diligent in promoting and spreading the faith the scholars, merchants, and people of the city. And due to Alexandria's international standing and growth and trade, the spread of Christianity exploded. The growth of Christianity in Alexandria birthed the Coptic Church, one of Christianity's oldest churches. This outreach soon spread to the surrounding rural areas, where with the establishment of Roman roads, boat travel up and down the Nile, it became even easier for missionaries to visit and convert many isolated areas. This was propelled by the conversion of Christianity by Emperor Constantine and its legalization in 313 AD. Much like the Christianization of pagan lands, Many of the churches and shrines associated with Christianity were built on already sacred monuments or converted temples. In many temples of Osiris, Amun, and Isis, their statues and figures were toppled and disgraced, and a cross put in their place. Over time, successive Roman emperors implemented bans and restrictions 
on the public worship of Egyptian gods, such as Theodosius the Great, who in 391 AD banned all sacrifices and worship in temples throughout the empire, with further emperors banning it only in Egypt. Though it must be said, not all Christian conversions in Egypt were peaceful, and many violently attacked Egyptian communities, such as the scholar Hypatia, who was a Greek Egyptian philosopher and mathematician, who was brutally murdered in 415 AD and had her limbs and skin removed and her body burned. There are many other attacks similar to this on Egyptian temples in Alexandria, and the political and religious persecution of Egyptian religion in the countryside prompted many to convert. Others wanted to escape political persecution and to escape economic isolation and economic disenfranchisement, prompting many others to convert as well. By 400 AD, all the urban areas of Egypt had become Christian. However, many of the rural parts still remained pagan. The last pagan temple in Egypt was built far to the south, outside of Rome's borders on the island of Philae, south of Aswan. The temple wall contains the last known inscription of hieroglyphics and demotic in Egypt, dated to 420 AD. By this time, many of the former kings and queens of Nubia, who had once proudly adopted Egyptian customs and beliefs, had become Christian as well. In 553 AD, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian ordered the Philae Temple to be closed, ending the last surviving Egyptian temple. There may have been some rural traditions and worship that continued to be practiced. However, by the conquest of the Islamic forces in 641 AD, the religion and culture of ancient Egypt had died out. Though Demotic Egyptian lived on through Christianity, the Coptic alphabet was based on the Demotic Ancient Egyptian Writing Script, an Egyptian writing script based on the Latin alphabet. Though Coptic is no longer widely spoken today, it is still used in Coptic church services, similar to how Latin was saved and preserved by the Catholic Church. The ancient Egyptian religion outlasted many of its counterparts. And by the time the last inscription was carved into the Philae temple, the worship of Ra, Osiris, Isis, and many others had predated any monuments made in Egypt. These gods were older than the pyramids of Giza, the temple of Thebes, and the very hieroglyphics that held their names and stories. Rather than going out with a bang, it went out with a whisper. As Egypt was introduced to new empires, new governments, and new religions, the ancient traditions and power of the gods and goddesses eroded, just as the Nile erodes away the sand along its bank, their names slowly becoming faded over time and eventually forgotten entirely. I want to end this episode with an ancient Egyptian poem. And as the sun sets over the west bank of the Nile and the sand shifts through the desert, Think of how one civilization built grand monuments to last for millennia in honor of their gods and their kings, only for those to be forgotten in later ages. It wouldn't be until 1822, almost 1600 years later, that someone deciphered the Rosetta Stone and the words and names of ancient Egypt were once again spoken. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. No thing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. I also want to add a final poem. The poem Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. 
Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share those videos with others. And if you have any other further suggestions for another video or day in the life, please comment below. Now there is a lot I definitely missed on, and it's an extremely large topic to cover. So I'll provide some links and books below that I would suggest reading to learn more on the topic. Death is before me today, like the recovery of a sick man, like going forth into a garden after sickness. Death is before me today, like the odor of myrrh, like sitting under a sail in a good wind. Death is before me today, like the course of a stream, like the return of a man from the war galley to his house. Death is before me today, like the home that a man longs to see after years spent as a captive.